Hello, the practitioner here again. We also have a better track record when it comes to our Supreme Court. For example, uh, in relation to politicians dealing with our Supreme Court, I'd like to um, uh, draw examples. Um, in the case of the relocation of the Cherokee, President Andrew Jackson, uh, when, uh, when the Cherokee were moved west uh, as part of the expansion, um, the, one of the heads of the Cherokee Nation uh, appealed a case to the Supreme Court um, trying to counter President Andrew Jackson's um, order that the Cherokee move out to reservations, saying that the Cherokee were an independent nation and should not fall under the jurisdiction of the United States. The Supreme Court at the time ruled in favor of the Cherokee Nation, saying that President Jackson's order was illegal by the Constitution. President Jackson was quoted as saying to the Supreme Court, enforce your own ruling, and then proceeded to go, on, go ahead with the, uh, he effectively floated the Supreme Court and went ahead with the relocation of the Cherokee Nation. Yes, another mistreatment of your First Nations people. Here's the difference. We had a similar incident back in 1995. Um, wasn't Roe versus Wade, no, frig. I've forgotten what the, uh, um, I've forgotten the name of the exact case, but this was our precedent in Canadian law. We did have a similar problem with the Canadian, uh, with the Canadian um, uh, Supreme Court. The difference was, in this case, the Supreme Court actually did override it, over, over exceed its authority. And uh, here's what happened. A, co um, a particular First Nations guy uh, was a particular First Nations guy was refused a license to be able to fish uh, because of the fact uh, he he he's a First Nations was allowed um, according to the C Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. There was a specific part, uh, you know, there's specific parts for every single minority that are allowed for basic rights. One of which is for First Nations, which clearly states that uh, insofar as their traditional hunting methods, they are still allowed what they need in order to survive. That was the, the exact word for word. We, um, unlike the U.S., which had various treaties and the like, we in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms enshrined rights for First Nations peoples, who were citizens of our country too. We also enshrined rights for disabilities and other minorities, um, you know, allowing that minorities were allowed certain rights to, uh, you know, basically, uh, it was again this sort of, um, as I said in the last video, it was sort of uh, in, in tradition of our rights and where other people's rights begin. So this way, um, you know, we, you know, we in our process of go doing government stuff don't have the right to infringe on minorities or on the majority either. Like we, we made sure we enshrined this in in there to make sure that the rule by the majority in a democracy would not necessarily infringe upon the minorities. This is the problem with uh, this is another problem. Uh, but anyway, uh, I digress. In the in this particular case, um, a native person appealed this um, the fact that they were not being able to get granted a fishing license or even to get basic granted fishing because this government agency floated the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The um, the uh, the First Nations person took it to the Supreme Court, appealed the case, and won. Uh, legitimately so. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court in this case overstepped their bounds. You see, not only did they actually say that the person was allowed to sell X number of pounds of fish, you know, a particular fi uh, fish without having a license to, uh, owing to their charter rights, they actually expanded on what the charter rights were and reassessed, um, uh, reassessed based on current standards of living that the First Nations people should be able to live uh, equivalently with a, with a middle class white person. They didn't, now the exact words of the charter read survival. They don't read comfortable standard of living. The uh, Supreme Court overrode, uh, the Supreme Court uh, overstepped their bounds in this and said that they, uh, the First Nations should be able to uh, sell the equivalent for an American First Nations. Every minority at this point started clamoring for more rights, more rights, more rights. And there was a huge uh, 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 roar and cry about this to the point where caricatures, which are legal in Canada like they are in the United States, um, you know, showed a... Uh, showed a, uh, a person dressed up in Indian costumes um, coming up for trick-or-treating to a white person's house saying, give me all your money, I have my, I'm claiming my rights to equality. <laughs> and, you know, it, it literally got out of hand. But anyway, about two years after this whole incident, a huge amount of hue and cry in the media, and, you know, and taking a look at some reasonable law, the Supreme Court, rather than the government floating this, you know, uh, rather than the government floating their decision, the, the, the government abided by the decision of the Supreme Court, but... The Supreme Court, after taking a look at the data, reassessed the case, reamended its decision back to what was appropriate, and uh, over, you know, it overturned its own decision. Well, not overturned it, but amended it. In Canada, uh, here's another thing in Canada, which is also great about our criminal and civil judicial system that is not available in your guys' case. Um, in small claims, you have to work before a judge. In civil suits, uh, you generally get a jury, and in criminal, you automatically get a jury of your peers. In Canada, for criminal courts, the defendant has a choice about how to um, about how to do this, and we stem this from the British common law aspect of uh, jury by one's peers. 
in the British tradition, uh, a lord, rather than being tried by, say, 12 random of the peasants, could actually ask to be tried by the fellow uh, nobles of the realm. We've got something similar, but the difference is that we don't do it based on nobles of the realm or status or class or minority. We do it as follows. You can choose to be elected by, uh, to, be, to be tried by a jury of one's peers, you know, the 12 standard like in the U.S., or you have the option of being tried by a judge. And the defendant has a choice of doing either one. The reason for this is as follows. If you're dealing with a relatively simple case, and you know, and you're pretty sure of your guilt or what have you, if you can, cho uh, you can choose to be tried by a judge, and you can be uh, pretty sure that when you get a plea bargain, you won't have to worry about the emotional response of a large chunk of, uh, of jury by peers going, we want the toughest sentence for this guy because we think he's some mass danger to society. Per your other episode, uh, per Penn and Teller's other episodes, um, it's known that you know, media bias and manipulation can easily affect this. Another thing, the American public may not necessarily be scientifically literate, particularly in issues pertaining to DNA and a lot of other complicated stuff. So, in Canada, you can either choose A, uh, a jury by one's peers to prevent the government from being corrupt and uh, you know, unfairly judging you, or B, if you are in a complicated issue, if you are, uh, if you are worried about a complicated issue, you know, say we're an issue where, logic, where over, emotion may override logic, the defendant has the option of choosing to be tried by a judge who is trained in logic and you know may have a bit better and you know maybe a bit better educated and informed in science and the like. Um, so this way, you know, it might help their case better. And the and the point is that the defendant. But here's the thing. You see, the thing is, there's not a force of being tried by a judge as opposed to a jury. The defendant has the option to choose between the two. So depending on what the case matter is, it could be better one way or the other. We allow for this. We allow we allow this extra freedom of choice. So this way, in case you, uh, in case our peers are biased, um, say on an issue of religion or something like that, or um, you know, if another bias may get in the way of a jury of our peers uh, properly being able to judge this, then we as defendants can say, hell no, I want a judge who's more likely to be impartial. It, or if it's an issue where suing the government, that uh, or if an, if it's an issue where um, uh, you know where it's suing the government or what have you. Uh, or the government is trying to bring the case to court, then the um, you know then we can say, hell, we don't want a judge. We want a jury of peers for fear the judge may be corrupted by the fact that they're working for the government. You see, like there's th that's where this extra system comes in. We've got a check and balance. We've got this option to cover that. Also, as well, a large chunk of our, our of our systems are designed for the facts that this way we don't do stuff like going off half cocked. Most politicians, like the ones in our House of Commons, have to rely on public popularity um, from uh, from election to election which means that they're worried constantly about polls. But we have systems put in place this way we can slow down. We can, you know, we have a tradition in our country of being able to slow down and actually think about what we're doing in terms of policy. So more than often than not, we'll do something similar to what the U.S. does. But we'll water it down a little bit because we realize that half the stuff that you guys end up, that your, that your government ends up picking up, we don't really need. You know, we end up discovering that half of it is superfluous. For example, the Patriot Act. We had a counterpart named Bill Sections uh, uh, Bill uh, Bill Section C36. Um, the U.S. Uh, still maintains all their stuff like wiretapping, being able to um, you know detain people without trial on charges of terrorism, that sort of thing. We got rid of the wiretapping and uh, detaining people 72 hours without charge, which was our thing. We also got rid of the ID card. Um, you know that, uh, that the U.S. is now going to be requiring for a lot of its citizens, um, according to one part of the Patriot Act, because of the fact that we realized that there was absolutely no necessity for it. When a couple of terrorists in our country got caught by the old methods of police work, yes, the only case where we had nearly t of near terrorist attacks, um, somebody wanted to blow up the CN Tower, we thwarted it using older traditional police tactics. And those people got brought before a standard trial. We used old-fashioned police work and old-fashioned techniques. They worked just as fine. And when this was shown before the media and the like, the government reassessed their position. We were up at the five-year limit. Uh, here's another thing. Unlike the U.S., which had their Patriot Act uh, you know, indefinite, we saw fit, in addition, in, uh, in, in our beginnings, to put a five-year uh, five clause, a five-year expiry clause, on our, pay, on our Section C-36. Meaning that on any of our anti-terrorist legislation, every five years we have to re-debate every section and see if it's still effective and still if it's, see if it's still necessary. Owing to this, we got rid of these three points on our section C36 because they were no longer necessary. See, that's the good thing about you know, and that's the, the difference between us and you. We have this respect of you know of other people's right. We deliberately enshrine it in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And on top of that, we understand that we need to slow down and be a little bit more rational. And we do that as a as a, as a public at a whole in the whole. We're trying to respect everybody, not just the majority.